Connection. Artificial Connection. Uh, Naamat uh, raises funds uh, to help empower women in Israel, women and children. So uh, women are um, charged according to their means. So if they have no money, it's all money from these donations that we are covering so that they can send their children and these women can work. Uh, also, in addition to uh, daycare centers, uh, there is vocational technical schools for high school dropouts for at-risk uh, youth. And there's counseling for women in prison and women uh, victims of abusive relationship. And uh, so Naama does a lot of work in Israel and also politically, they try to um, raise awareness and uh, defend causes of women. And um, Gola Mayer was one of our fundraising first women who came to the States to raise funds for, it used to be Pioneer Woman and it's currently Naamat. So we thank you all. Let me see, I'm trying to get one more. Oh, there's one more person who's trying to enter the Zoom. Uh, let me see why she can't. Uh, one second, please. I don't know why she can't log in. Nine four seven nine four four. Yeah, I've given her the right information. Okay. At any rate, um, I thank you all for tuning in from different parts of the world. That's really nice, and uh, I hope you're all safe. And today we have a very special guest, Rosemary Glazer, and she's going to talk about hair, skin, uh, philo the philosophy, and art. So, um, Rosemary, I want you to start, please, and then we will continue asking you some questions. And thank you for preparing this presentation for us today. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Thank you, uh, everybody, for, for being here in this call. I appreciate the invitation. And yeah, as you said before, if it was not for these uh, gatherings, we would be insane in this pandemic. And we have learned and met a lot of people. And this is a moment to, to grow and to learn more about everybody, given that we have the circumstances to be in a single place, but at the same time, all over the world. So for those of you who don't know me, I have dedicated three, four parts of my life to the research, creation, teaching, and uh, study of the visual arts in the different countries where I have lived or stayed long stays of my of time. And here I'm going to show you a selection of the artwork I have made and uh, some references that inspired me to talk about subjects that move me. On the screen that you see now, uh, there's a piece that much, much very much uh, speaks about what's happening between us right now. The port that is rendered there is called DVI port, which is like the predecessor of the HDMI, which is what we are using to connect our devices and be able to see each other. As a matter of fact, part of this image shows inside of this rectangle like little heads, like we are now in this Zoom call. Um, now I'm going to send, I, no, is it not moving? Yeah, okay. So this drawing it is from the series uh, Medusa meets Perseus. In this, you see two figures. One is a Medusa a colored body and the other is a figure made like a human body made with ink. It is talking about the transformation in, for me, what I wanted to address is how, even though there are storms, the beauty of the medusas is still allow them to, to like captivate us with their beauty, but at the same time are, are able to float. Uh, 
I was born in a very progressive Jewish family in Peru. I was raised within Jewish education and I have experimented culture and customs from the different countries where I have lived or spent periods of time. Also, I had customs from my ancestors that I guess from their DNA, I have it like filtered. This is how my head got filled with a lot of symbolic references about the body, the skin, the hair, a lot of the very traditional practices and beliefs. And somehow I started to use the language of art to dig in about the soul, the human being, its thoughts, and the relationships we have. The image that we have on screen is called redirecting a thought. Um, maybe you would like to tell me what do you see in this image? Anybody there who wants to participate? I see a person, but it, it, it's not a happy person. It's probably <laughs> scared or, or uh -huh. depressed, or it's not a happy person. Uh huh. Sure. Uh -huh. Well, somebody else. It is a man. It looks like a man. Uh huh. Okay. Well, you see, it is a figure made with, with a human figure, evidently made with the silicon drops. And it is made on the, the support, the base is a photographic paper treated with chemicals. And it is interesting the way that each people see according to their references. I see the mind. Wait, esto que pasa? The mind for me is like a palimpsest of visual imageries like slides so if either of you saw here like a not happy image or something strange or something hanging or maybe like an electrified body or things like that it may relate to the way we interpret things according to what we have seen believed and learned in life the moment i was doing this this drawing, I was thinking, I'm drawing human figures in transparent ink in silicon in order to talk about thoughts. Thoughts are something that is are impossible to attain. It's just something abstract and yet they belong to the human being. So I wanted to put the shape of a human being, but in transparent, meaning it's something unattainable. It's just still abstract. Um, when you and Abel invited me to, to give this talk, I started thinking my work in different angles um, because there are many questions about gender, race, identity, color, even skin conditions that are related to my work. And also some of those are treated in the Talmud and in the Tanakh. So I thought that in this space, maybe it would be more people relating to the origins of my understandings in life. And therefore we could have the same references while understanding the, the visuals. In this image, you see uh, two figures. One on the front is like a sketch of a human. And in the back is like a denture. The frontal image has like a, like a, the head is made like a bubble gum. In English, you say bubblegum head, like talking about somebody who doesn't have anything on the head, like air. And in the back, it is a denture that reminds me of my Bobes laugher. I like to use humor on my drawings. Here you have another uh, of the series of the, the Bobes laugher, the denture. One of my skills, uh, of my skills on as, as an artist is to pinpoint subjects that move me, questioning to provoke a reaction on the public. And in this way, help to create consciousness by offering my grain of sand and a way to transform our world. So in the course of this talk, if I'm going to tackle buttons that maybe you will feel sensitive about, I will be more than glad to talk about it after I finish, or you can start sending messages and we will talk about it. I think I, all right. 
I think I might have been like 10 years old when I found out that in the Judaism, a woman is apt to raise children and marry once their first um, signals of nubil appear on her body. That means the first pubic hairs and the first armpit hairs. And the apt denotes a passive eligibility. It means that the female is capable to, to create, not to say if she has the mental, emotional, physical, or even economical capacity to do so, or even if she wants to do it. So it's possible that as a reaction to that um, affirmation as an act of resistance uh, to a patriarchal society that defined politically on my body, I decided I was not going to have any children, but that my descendants were gonna be uh, paintings hanging on the walls of museums and art collections. So that's how later I decided to resignify the idea of hair. And that's how maybe some, somewhere in my mind, I decided eventually to start using hair to create art and talk about identity and more things. In Spanish, we talk about a hairy situation when we want to name something that it's uh, difficult to control, something like a beast. So by portraying the fear from different angles, I want to control it, I want to reduce it, I want to hold it. So that's how I made this series of fears using means human hair to draw. Now, what does it mean that I resignify the idea of hair? When we sketch or we hatch, we, there's a drive that emanates from our brain and sends a signal to our hand and we grab a pencil and then we start writing or doodle. And when we have visualizing our brain. So I decided I didn't want any intermediates between the head and the paper. I wanted this little wire that grows out of our head, like that it's closest to our most uh, human part, which would be like the brain because of thoughts and the beast part, which would be the hair and unite them together and use this little wire, the hair to draw. And well, thinking about nightmares, I created this series of drawings. For example, the one that you just see on the screen belongs to this group of drawings that talk about pedophilia. Um, it's horrible. It uh, is terrible how still in the 21st century, many children are still treated like disposable objects or like uh, uh, exchanging objects as it is in the time where they didn't even have rights long ago. Now, which other way I could represent thoughts being be something so unattainable and abstract? I started using plastics and vinyls to show, as I said before in the previous drawing, to use the transparency of the material to talk about the abstract and the thoughts. And to use by using human figures, I was talking about human beings, and by using vinyls and, and silicones, I was talking about the thoughts. What do you see in this image? Do you want to talk about it? If anybody is inspired by this image? I see a lot of people, uh, they're suspended. They're suspended in the air in time and space. And to me, they look like they're probably just facing the back. They're not, I don't see the front, at least from this point of view. Um, I don't know, it's quite open to, to, it could be a queue, it could be people waiting in line for something, it could be time and space, different stages. I think it's open to many things, as you say, your interpretation, whatever is on your brain. Looks spooky to me. <laughs> <laughs> what That's is good. What, what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there is, a, as you said, there is a, a group of figures hanging on the ceiling of this gallery space. 
some people say they may be ascending or some people think they are being hung. Some people relate them to like the Plato's cavern or some say that it is like inside of a butcher's uh, refrigerator. Um, as I said, yeah, depends on the references of the viewer, the things that you would see there. My idea with this piece was to align thoughts and have them easy to understand, not to let them disturb us. Because by having many messy thoughts in our head, we, we get to be super disturbed and the mind doesn't flow uh, naturally. And then we end up having a lot of emotions, messy ideas. And then we end up even having chemical reactions in the body and then we get sick. So by aligning them, thought by thought, idea by idea, then I thought, okay, then we can pick one at a time. Um, so that's about Marie? that. Rosemary, may I ¿Sí? tell you something? Hola. Sure. Uh, I am Sara from Peru. ¿Sí? Uh, nice meeting you. I've never met you before here in Peru or anywhere else. Uh -huh. But uh, this, uh, uh, I understand what you say. And uh, this is a very like peaceful image. But uh, for me, it was like peaceful, but at the same time, like uh, thoughts in a, a ghost way. Like we all have thoughts that can um, bring, uh, remain like ghosts. Uh, that they pass and and they leave something that we may um, think about or just go their way to another head to be a uh, hold. Correct, correct. You got it. That's exactly what happens with thoughts. They can either entangle you. Or, or you can take one at a time and then flow with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there is a ghostly uh, relationship with them. Actually, one of the things that many people relate to this is like if these were souls ascending and a lot of people think of them like a Holocaust and because I'm Jewish, then everybody goes straight there every time they see my, answer, my, my background. Hmm. So, but it's interesting the way that people relate to it. Hmm. So now I'm going to go to the next image. When I have wanted to address the human being, its skin, its, and its fluids, I have used materials such as paraffin and or silicon, but when I wanted to use ink or opaque materials, it has been to address the most pieced or bodily parts. So to talk about fragility as well, uh, so the transients of life, I have used photography as well as hair. In this manner, I'm referring about memory and identity. Now with this piece, smack it, the, piece is shown on the screen on the two sides of it. It is a domestic utensil, it is a pan. On the, I mean, the image that you see on the left, it uh, shows like the mold of a bite on paraffin. And then on the other side, you can see the photograph of a screen, a person screaming, but it is covered with silicon, black silicon. So it's like if somebody is underneath, let's say ground or something, wanting to get the scream out of it. Now, why did I use this utensil? As you know, it's like historically, pots and pans belong to the realm of the kitchen and the kitchen for like thousands of years have belonged to the, to the, where we traditionally women belong. Actually, even in, in Alaha, there is this law that states that uh, the, the man is allowed, the husband is allowed to 
divorce his wife if god forbids she burns the rice wow so <laughs> in this context the pot represents a woman's way to express the nourishment in a relationship as well as her capacity to scream in the domestic or the the intimate realm now when i was doing this uh, piece i was also thinking of viol uh, domestic violence and it is also as a way to use like a weapon but in the last actually like from, i think maybe already 20 years cacerolas as these are called in spanish pots or pans um have been used as a way to make noise and to cry from the side from this the side of the intimate women have been using it to cry for help to scream for something that is happening in their lives and that's why the usage of the cacerolazo uh, it has echoed in different latin american countries in times of uncertainty since 1970s it started first in chile with the the women of the bourgeoisie in, in were crying against screaming against Salvador Allende socialism because there was lack of uh, products in the grocery stores. So they started screaming with their pots and pans. Ten years later, the mothers of the disappeared in Argentina started screaming for that, uh, raising their voice to talk about it and about the unemployment and about the repression in the Plaza de Mayo. And decades later, same thing happened in Venezuela because the socialist uh, government and the people wanted to scream and say, this is enough, basta ya. And lately we thought, we've been seeing these marches and strikes in Colombia uh, where people started to scream uh, first to claim the their, their race. I mean, the government decided to raise the prices on, a, on the middle of, a, of the COVID-19 pandemic and decided he wanted to, put, I mean, the government wanted to raise the tax reform and people started to scream about it. And then people started using again the pots and pans to claim the excessive repression that the police officers were putting on the um, people who were doing the strikes, the civilians that went into protest, but then the police officers were putting much more uh, power on them. So the usage of pots and pans have been a way of using, of uh, showing a, a screen from the domestic without using weapons, but as a way to say, this is a shield, but also this is a screaming weapon. My interest in addressing humanity led me to go from starting the new body to show the human beings before without masks. Sorry, we couldn't screen... hear you. The microphone was moving. Can you repeat? Can you start again this part? Yes. Uh, by, I wanted to use transparent materials to address humanity by drawing transparent or nude bodies, not because I wanted to talk about movie especially or eroticism especially it was more because i wanted to talk about humanity without masks now that is a paradox talking today about masks even the times we're living but anyhow so i decided to make this drawing of a of a human body getting into a mikve by using multiple silicon drops and the silicon drops give a sense of light into the whole uh, composition because not only it gives three-dimensionality three to the painting it also gives a glitter into the room of the beholder so it is like a relationship of what happens actually when the person goes into the mic. It is a way to clarify thoughts and then to raise them to another level. Or like, for example, when there is per this person that goes to a conversion process, 
They go inside the mikveh bath to symbolically transform this human being from non-Jew to, to Jew by elevating their soul, their, their, their thoughts. Or like when a woman uh, immerses into the mikveh because she's passing from the nida and then uh, kind of cleaning, cleaning them, themselves. There are many reasons that inspire me to reach on the subject of the skin. Uh, we know that historically pap papyrus and parchment were the preceding of paper. And as I was looking for a lasting material for my work, because parchment, as you know, was made of skin, sheep skin. And so I thought of using a material that relates in a way to what has been used historically to also something that can address subjects such as identity, perception, permanence, curiosity, tactility, and humor. And that's how I came with the idea of using the skin to talk about all these issues. And within the skin, hair is also part of it because it's an excrescence of the skin. And then I'm going to talk about one of each of these subjects. Perception is one of the subjects that most endears me. I think as we were talking before, it be belongs to the references of the beholder. It depends on that. And everybody will always have multiple perceptions of a single thing, just depending on their own references. And they we could be, Let's say now we are 11 and we can all be seeing the same screen and we can all have different perceptions of the same image. But if we were on a 3D in a room, then the perceptions will be multiplied because each of us has a different view, not only mental, but visual. So from the beginning of my art career, I was very much into thinking of that about perception and I was, very not worried but preoccupied of why is it that we want to have this ex aesthetic experience and we go to, let's say to a museum and we're not allowed to get close to it there's always this guard there's always this green line saying no you just can walk more far you have to be just from there and my idea was to cross that line and then if that line was not able to be crossed then then I would do the work that it would be coming outside the wall or to give like a hand to the beholder so there will be a true dialogue between the artist and the art through the art to the viewer and this is how when I was still doing my studies I came with this picture and it is called Sweet Woman and it the uh, addresses two subjects. One is that the people who are working in the street and they, even though they are being bare skinned or showing their, themselves outside, they barely show their emotions because they have to protect themselves. And also it's about, you don't even know the people who are there they are out and they have to put shields to survive. So what I use to make this, this piece, this, it is one of three pieces on, a, on an installation. It is the lid of a sewer. Inside there is like this cushion made of plastic vinyl and, and glycerin that you wanna touch. Like you, have you seen those uh, inflatable books like when kids are starting to learn about tactility so the idea with this was to engage the public on that type of experience so that you want to go and touch you want to go and participate with this dialogue and well to the kids well into the 21st century the live shows us through a pandemic how important it is the sense of touch I and mean, if we don't have support groups and we don't have experience of affections, this is very difficult to deal because as human beings, we are social beings and we need the tactility, we need this interaction. 
and it is because of platforms like NAMAC or, or like another where I participated, Mali Hari Apocryphos, that we were able to create social bonds worldwide and maintain our sanity. On the screen, we see two pieces of the group of bodies of water with this. Uh, uh, I, I was experimenting many years with different materials and I was talking, looking for materials that would last because I was experimenting and the materials were not permanent. And of course, one of the laws of nature is the lack of permanence and we will all pass but I wanted to defy that law and find on a material that will last longer than me. So that's how I started to intervene photos to talk about these transitions and to talk about how our past on this lifetime, maybe we are advancing technologically, but we are going backwards in terms of ecology. So I started to use also this uh, material, hair and inks, to show the three-dimensionality on the on the works, but also to show that how by stepping into the, the nature, we are not helping it, we are just going backwards. And why did I use here to point to that? Because I don't know if I told you before, but I am Peruvian, and I'm very familiar with mummies, Asian mummies. And if you haven't seen them, there is something that is always still present, even thousand years after they pass, and that's the hair. And not only the hair is there next to the little bones, but also it is through them that you can see their history and maybe how they live, how they pass, what happened to them. So I think it has a lot of uh, symbolism and I thought it's interesting to use that material to give more references to the world. This piece is uh, to talk about a site. It is an image of, a, of, a, of an eye but it's printed on a cyanotype. It is the material that the architects use to make their, their sketches. And by adding something so tactile like the silicone, I was adding more perspective to the sides. So with all these uh, things that I've been doing, I've been finding there are correlations in different area, areas. In all of them, like medicine, psychology, religion, social sciences, pop culture, architecture, films, contemporary art, all of them to find a way to understand the other. And by using the different significances that hair and skin can offer, I was finding my way to uh, find a connection to all these uh, areas. And in this series, Rented Loves, I, I started doing it once I finished doing my Bachelor of Arts. You see, I went out of, I finished my career. I started looking for a job in the newspapers in the ads. And then I could not find a, a job. I only found plenty ads that were looking for, like in the personal ads, that were looking for some way to relate to other people. I don't know if they were looking for friendships or they were looking for something else. But to me, it was very interesting to see how it is already very difficult to find a match in the groups that you move in, where you're schooling, where you are working. And 
to me, the idea of shiduhim was always very strange. I thought it was just like a group of people who didn't have much to do and they just wanted to, to gossip. I didn't think that that was possible to, to relate to. And so I found this 20 years later, after seeing this, this project, I find myself using these online platforms to meet my current husband. <laughs> So what we see in this uh, advertising that I use in the in the in this piece, the ad says, "I love having that chocolate shop, cheap ice cream, and Chinese food. And if you are a single white Jewish male between 50 and 65, and you enjoy the same, let's join and eat." So I thought it's really funny how people think that only with that they are gonna use find their, the true match. And that's how I started doing this, this series. It is a mix, a combination of a Xerox printed on, the, on a linoleum, and then there's a drawing on top of that. So these are the eight, eight main reasons that have been going through all my work and they are all related to body and skin and my interests are shown here is that the relationship between body and landscape the obsession to modify bodies the people are seen as consumable objects the hair is seen as an allegoric material um, how the marks on the skin show traces of time and how i wanted to work with the basics that's how in Spanish, you say to work with the fingernails. And then here I thought, okay, I'm gonna work with hair. It's like still going to the basics and how I wanted to address interpersonal relationships. And with all that, talk about race, gender, and identity. Now, with the inclusion of photographic devices in the electronic appliances we use every day, such as the computer, the phone, the iPad, the mobiles, etc., we have uh, been kind of mechanic in the uh, in the notion of framing a scene because all of us use the photo, the camera of these devices, and everybody has become a photographer. And the interest about that is that once you learn how to get close or, or far from the image that you are framing, then you are getting into like micro universes, depending on how far or how, how close you get to the subject that you are framing. But in the case of skin, when you are very close to it, and then you print this image, the image is enhanced in such big proportions, the sense of skin or hair completely transforms. So you end up seeing this as if it was a big landscape. You no longer see hair. You see like a piece of, uh, of nature, like, like a pine, like a piece of charcoal, like little sticks. You see everything else, but you don't really think in that format that we're talking about skin. So in that sense, the body is becoming a landscape. But what was the image originally? So you blew it up? Is it, I don't understand. This image is, Uppsala is a, is a glacier. It's a glacier in the Patagonia. I wanted to talk as I was talking before about how in our in our way to relate to nature, we are leaving our traces and maybe we are developing in high levels technologically wise, but ecologically wise, we are leaving traces and we are not uh, allowing this planet to keep staying for generations to come. For example, the, the global warming is doing damages to this to the glaciers. And 
So this is a picture of the glacier. And then I, I did like an incision on the, on the photograph, adding my trace, let's say, like when you're talking about the carbon print, let's say I drew with human hair and then I enlarge it. But then when I am doing this picture, let's say I draw on a picture, then I use a scanner and then I enlarge it. And then I take a picture of that and I enlarge it again and then paint on it. So the different levels of this, of these uh, stages on the work make this the resulting image into something with three dimensions, with many depths. And then you don't re longer relate to that like the original piece of hair, but like if you are out in the land. It would have been interesting to see that juxtaposition to see the original without your alteration and then this one. Yes. yes. Very cool. That could be a good idea, always taken in mind for the next presentation. Mm. So for example, in this piece, these are images that are printed on one square meter each model. So, in the print, in the computer screen, you might see maybe you have, I don't know, 14, 17 inches of a screen. But if you see that in the in the format where they are printed, you see like a different texture. You don't really know what is that is there. Are you following me? Yeah. It Again, it's very difficult to to understand what exactly is going on there because it everybody can interpret. I see maybe clouds. Yeah. But maybe what about the shadows? The shadows, how do you see the shadows are made of? What are those lines for you? Uh, well, it might be the hair because you're alluding to hair a lot. So exactly. That's but if not, you would not know it's here. I would have thought it was ink, ink marks. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's what I'm saying. It loses the, its nature because of the size. And also because in the ending result, it is a printed image. It is, it is not that you see the hair stuck up front. It is, it's a print of a print that has been elaborated in different stages. And therefore, when you see it in the on the wall, you see more of a three-dimensional, three-dimensional. Now, why did I start doing these dark polluted clouds? I I have a typo here. I'm sorry. Um, I was into this uh, yoga meditation class. I, I I'm sure that you were related to this uh, term mindfulness that they tell you, okay, you have to meditate and you have to be in the present. You cannot think forward, you cannot think backward, think now. And think if your thoughts come, come across, think of the thoughts like if they were clouds. David has something to say? Please unmute, we cannot hear you. David, unmute, yeah. we cannot yeah. hear you. I'm on, I'm on mute now. I wanted, I was wondering why you chose the perfect square for these, because, because it violates uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the panoramic uh, kind of view that we all have, or is it just an accident? No, it was not an accident. I thought it was more easy to transport when I was uh, commissioned for this show and the easiest way to filling to the gate of our plane in order to do this show was maximum. I had one square meter. <laughs> so I had to adjust all the set of okay. things were going to be inside max one square okay. meter. So, so it was a practical consideration and not, and not a deliberate violation of the, of the human perceptual uh, frame. No, no. It had to be just with the practicality of the door of the of the plane great mm -hmm. yeah sometimes you have to be uh, 
to be more flexible. <laughs> Great. So I was talking about why the polluted clouds. So when you are in this uh, mode of meditation, they tell you, okay, you have to be in the present. Think of your thoughts like clouds. Don't get entangled into the thought. Just let the, the clouds pass. And then I'm trying to think of one thing at a time, not get entangled of the thoughts of the clouds. And then I see all these clouds are very dark, very charged, full of hair. So I could not uh, actually be very present, but then I came up with the idea of these polluted clouds, polluted thoughts. And I thought then, of course, about the impact on the planet and how by flying more and more, the amount of planes on the skies are leaving these trace. And as I was saying before, also it, once the images are enlarged in these formats, the sense of landscape is more clear. Here, it is a picture of a skin that has been painted and carved. But if you see it in these sites, you don't longer relate to that as skin. You see there is like a landscape. This, with, this is a drawing elaborated with uh, silicon drops. It has two figures. One is a, uh, how do you say that in English? A clipper, a clipper, and then the front, the one that is made with a graphite and the back figure is like a folded body. And with that, I want to address the, the urge to modify bodies. Uh, you see, there is like a human obsession for changing bodies. I think in our culture, we see it like a, a, every baby, every ba male baby that is born eight days after it's born has to have this little cut to be part of this covenant and be understood as Jewish. And science has proven that doing that tiny surgery it has an impact in medicine, so it's better to do that not only for the Jewish fact, but also for health purposes. But not only we have that, there are other cultures, many cultures that have this need of modification. For example, the, the Mayas, the Incas, the Chinookans, the Egyptians had this need to modify skulls. They would bind with two pieces of wood and something else to keep deforming their skulls, like, if, like to look as what they consider their gods. And there's this object in insertion in some uh, tribes in Africa so that their women don't look so nice. And then they don't feel, the, the males don't feel like the women are being uh, attractive to others. And also there's other reasons, like for example, this woman in Thailandia, like saying like in Maasai tribes, they put these rings uh, all along their neck, not only to look them, to make them look taller, but because they are gonna protect themselves from a bite of a lion. Or there's also this uh, practice made by the Chinese that is called the lotus flower. The, they were binding the feet of the women and their feet would be useless. They just wanted this to look like what they considered a lotus flower. And in that way, they would be able to marry people in, in higher castes in their society. Another way of modifying body it is using scarification. It's a way of tattooing. They insert little pieces of sand or of pebbles underneath the skin. And with that, they create this uh, three-dimensional uh, textures on the skin of the bodies. And with that, they look like if they were 
crocodiles. Why crocodiles? Because with that, they feel like they are being protected, like what they consider their gods. And they feel powerful. Same thing happened with the tattoos that we see so often now since last century or maybe before. People are doing that in order to belong to a group or because they want to feel they are, they are marking a pinnacle in their life or because they want to feel more of warriors and they want to show like they are able to achieve something or if they were able to cross the pain of that, then they can cross any challenge in life. Now, although it doesn't seem to us normal, we, we don't relate to that. And actually in the Jewish tradition, that's not allowed because we are uh, using this body just like a vehicle. And this is like a kind of not belonging to us. We should keep it nice and, and clean and, and kept. Uh, but there is this, uh, as a result of this, of the social and cultural changes that start happening in the 1970s by the mass media, then there's this need of the athletic toned and free of, of wrinkled bodies that there's boom of surgeries and uh, modifications on the body started. And that's how all the, all the idea of modifying the body started like contemporary wise. Now that fear of uh, not having such a perfect uh, body also is what, what pushed me to do this, this drawing because I put myself into extremous hours of exercise and the fear of becoming something like this, which is a woman body with half a ham leg. And yes, you would say like this is not a kosher uh, image because we are in a, in a Jewish group, but also it would not be kosher to do all these modifications in our bodies. Now, as a consequence of the advance on industrial development, capitalist societies have started seeing the people as consumable objects like merchandise is what no longer serves its purpose, like it was like a computer or something that can be disposed, it is changed, not, really, not even fixed. Now, but what happens when that idea is seen onto people? Meaning like what happens when the object of consumption is a person? how technology has turned us into being with a number and how without them we see to be like nobody. To make any purchase, to, to be registered in the health service, to get uh, anything we need, we need a, a number, an ID, a phone number. Everything is related, linking us as human beings to numbers. And that way we are classified. Like in a way, the people in the Holocaust were classified just in a group of numbers. So what I'm showing you here is like in 2012, this group of Israelis were moved by their departed relatives who were Holocaust survivors, marked with the numbers, decided to honor them by tattooing on their skin the numbers that their relatives had because their relatives were passing. Now, it's crazy because you know that in Judaism, tattooing is forbidden. However, there's this paradox and they wanted to honor the family. And following the idea of inscribing on the skin comes the work that I'm going to introduce you here which is part of the same series, how I started the talk, which is the pathogenous power, where I wanted to uh, inscribe ports of these devices into our skin. So we will no longer need this as intermediates. We will be able to relate again as people 
with, uh, without the usage of these devices. So what I did in this piece is inscribing as a tattoo by drawing a video port on the skin and then I turn it into a cell screen made of latex. It's like going back to the skin. In this way, I will be turning the people into cyborgs that work between human and technological. So what I am addressing here is how with technology, I mean, I'm pleased that we have technology because otherwise we, right now we will not be able to meet and we will not have these gatherings, but also it's technology and the idea of the social media and that we can be connected with everybody that we have uh, in a way reduced the quality of the communication. Now we use the short messages and just little emojis. And then we think that we're sending like, a, ah, how about, have a nice day, how about, uh, happy day, a bright day, and then you're sending this emoji with little stars, and then you search somewhere and you find out that what you thought it was like, ah, have a nice day, it means like I'm busy because the emojis relate to us in a different way because the understanding or the interpretation of these icons, it's, although it's universal, not everybody knows what is the meaning of them. Going back to the idea of the perception, it changes depending on the references. And although those are icons like uh, that should be universal, we not everybody is knowledgeable of that. So that's how I came to this idea of the um, inserting pores into our bodies so that we go back to the real communication between us. And then we can have real personal connections. Now let's pass from the joy of technology to a fascination for what is left on us from animals, the hair, which took me to think on a series of reflections about the allegories of hair as an element of sculpture or how the tension that exists between this element and the material that is uh, touching the surface of the paper, of the, of the art. And probably this was the first drawing I made. I wanted to address something that is um, with us now because of a pandemic, it's more close to us and we never want to address it and have to deal with it because it's like, well, we know for sure it's gonna come. That's La Pelona in Spanish is hairy in English, and it is frightening, but we have to accept that it's with us. And a lot of, and another way of addressing it is by using humor, as we Jewish are very well known and versed. It is like laughing about our dramas that we can deal with it. In this drawing, I'm addressing also the subject of race, shadow woman, mujer sombra. Um, it, it is a hole into the paper because the hole that marks racism in the society. It is also this hole, it is also the shadow of, the, of this figure, but it is the shadow of society to have this type of divisions. I, I wanted to address that here because at some point I learned that being Jewish, we claim that we should not be seen as different. Yeah, we, we're told like we are the chosen people, but we are also looking within us and we cannot define others, but what they are, what they are not. So we are being racist within ourselves. Actually, uh, during my adolescence, I grew up seeing how Sephardim and Ashkenazim are seeing each other as, as not human. Like you don't belong to this, you don't belong to that. You have to be from the same group. Otherwise you cannot relate. 
And the years later, I found that there were also Jews with very high pigmented skin and that upon their arrival to the promised land, they were looking forward to build that state, but they themselves were looked upon down because they had a different color skin. So that means there's a lot of racism. And in the same way, they were treated like second and third class people, like, like the Romanian or like the Polish, because of their roots, they're treated like if they were gypsies or they, if they were thieves. So my reflection is that even having a Jewish state, we still think that we've been striving to be accepted by the rest of the world, like a, like a nation with a right, but if we don't behave accordingly, humanitarianly within ourselves, how are we expecting others to see ourselves with the same, uh, the same lens? And uh, would you say it is a matter of race, ideology, class, or is it the human condition? I don't know. I think it is a human condition and it is just embedded into us and we should try to be, to change that, to be more acceptance of others. What do you think this represents? And I am very happy that you are addressing these social issues, I think they're very important and we still have a lot of problems and I don't ever see them being resolved in our lifetime. I hope someday we don't discriminate. And um, I think it's daring of you and, and valuable that you uh, portray uh, how uh, some of us feel that we are better than others. And uh, I had an email just sent to me about these amazing women who are professionals and they're in the Olympics. So everything was amazing, but then the commentary wasn't as good. They say, oh, why do we give so much uh, um, claim to the poor people who have been paid scholarships to excel at the Olympic Games, uh, doing it for marketing, you know, just using these people as marketing tools. So. My point is every, everybody, everything is valuable. It's not that one is better than the other. I think it's equally as good that if the poor people were given a chance and they excel, fantastic. And um, if very highly professional people have the time and capacity to excel in other uh, areas, that's amazing as well. So we should all embrace, applaud, uh, encourage everybody to be the very best they can be at whatever they choose to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy you are addressing social issues, which are so important in, mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alright, Kamas. This group of images I'm going to show now are reflecting how the marks on the surface of the skin are a trace of time. Um, the skin shows the experiences we have in our mind, like we can, if we have any diseases or things or things happening in, in our heads, we show that through our skin and you can tell what something is going on. And these different situations can be apparently harmless, but they become visible and, and it can be reflected on the skin. Now there are two groups of works on this. Both of, of them are using skin and hair and parts of the body to, to show these two groups of works. And this is a reflection about working with very little materials. I wanted to play with the word hair rising, like nerve rising. And it is humorous to me because it's the nervous system, but it is already with the hairs rising. Now I hear you use color um, hair, although most of the times that I have used hair, I use uh, 
natural, not colored, because I want the lasting of, of the material not to deteriorate. But in that case, is the first time I use color. Here, I'm going back to this group of work that I'm using uh, bodies of water to talk about the impact we're doing on, on the land, on the landscapes of nature. And this was just at the end of the usage of hair. It, it started as a reflection on a spillage of oil that happened in the Philippines in 2000. Uh, what was that, 2006, I think. And the ecologists called for the inhabitants of the island to everybody to shave their heads or to cut their hairs and to use the hair in order to, to clean the water because the, the hydrosoluble and uh, bioabsorbent and hydrophobic qualities of hair and being a hair and organic element, they would be use, using hair in order to collect the material from the water, but then don't, not leaving more residues to throw to the garbage and more easily to collect. So that's the story with the, with the work about hair with water. Now with the industrial development and the increasing burning fuel fossil, the sea acidification has accelerated. This parallel to global warming has caused the sea to get warmer and medusas and jellyfish have increased. So it is no casualty that weaving very delicately after years of working on this project, I would come up with the myth of Medusa and her beautiful mane. Because as you know, according to the Greek myth, Medusa, the most beautiful of the mortals, was a very modest priestess who was paying homage to Athena in her temple, the goddess of wisdom and strategy, and being Poseidon, the fearsome god of the oceans, uh, found a way to abuse Medusa. And as a revenge for desecrating her temple, Athena punishes Medusa, turning her into a monster and her beautiful mane into a bundle of snakes. But not happy with it, curse her sight, making sure that whoever sees her up front gets petrified. So what you see on the screen is uh, the color figure represents Medusa, the giant Medusa, and the graphite figure represents Perseus, and both are entangled wrestling. So the story tells that time after the king Polydectus challenges Perseus to get Medusa's head in exchange for liberating her mother, Perseus asks for, for help of Athena, so she gives him a bronze mirror and it works as a shield. And then she goes uh, after Medusa. But another character that was petrified from a side in Jewish history is Lot's wife. She looks back and she gets uh, petrified. But while the, with the story of blood, we learn that when we get entangled into the past, we can stay frozen forever. Because with the Medusa, we learn that when confronting a trauma, we have to, we may stay trapped. So it is necessary that we learn how to approach it, like from an angle, from the side, with craft and with patience such as Perseus did with Medusa, by using a mirror that reflected her image without crossing sights and protecting himself while approaching her without being seen and then beheading her. So as Jewish people, we have learned about resilience, the capacity to observe the scenario and adapt around a given situation. This is another way of my series to, to look at this struggle between these two characters. The 
the body is made with silicon. Her, her body is made with silicon and enamel, and he's, it's with graphite. Um, in another version of this myth, Perseus picks up two drops of Medusa's blood. One has the ability to kill, and the other has the ability to heal and revive. So in the Greek myth of Medusa, the need to face the challenges with courage. Medusa captures the essence of trauma, and this describes her path to transformation. Now, this is innate to human uh, beings, the capacity to heal going through, through traumas. Like in the middle of adversities, we have to learn, go through it, and keep going. Now, as a woman, I'm disturbed by the vilification of the feminine gender in the patriarchal societies. According to the masculine side, the woman provokes the man with her attitude, with how she dresses, with what she says, with how she responds in front of a society ruled by laws imposed by men. But in a society where both parts need each other to keep growing, why is it that both genders are in question in the same manner. In the myth of Medusa, both Medusa and Perseus are victims of the system. Many times the man is freed from his responsibility, but we need two to tango. This is the way the world has been created and many stories tell us that. So in this series, I want the two to tango, finding a way for what's going on, not putting one in a higher power than the other. On the chapter 19 of Nevi'im, the judges, the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, narrates the story of how an old man hosts in his house a Levite and his wife upon the stocking of some town men, the old man offers him uh, to stay. The old man offers his virginal daughter and the foreigner's daughter for the villagers to do with them as they please, given that the villagers deny that. Then to save the skin, the Levite pushes his wife out of the house into the villagers' face. They rape her incessantly all night long, and then she's freed upon the sunrise. Once the woman comes back to the old man's doorway, she paints as she sees her husband. But he feels so humiliated that he decides to cut her into little pieces and declare the war to Benjamin's clan. The severe body of this woman serves to call for a war to all the tribes of Israel in order to clean this man's honor. Although in the Bible, rapes and abuse to women are forbidden, there are many stories that normalize using the woman as an exchange object. The problem relies that while we keep accepting that as part of God's design, women like Sarah, mother of Judaism, may be raped in exchange to their husbands, not to be battered. The abuses will still be accepted, given that these are the models to follow ever since the Bible was written. From the beginning of history, the first woman was labeled as the mean, the seductress, not like the curious, not the wise. And when she's considered the role of procreator, this wrong interpreted concept easily shifts between wife, mother, and prostitute. Unfortunately, still in the 21st century, this type of abuse keeps and will be happening as long as we keep accepting from what is considered sacred that the female body may still be used to clean the honor as a spoils of war. In the image, the myth of Medusa, she morphs from being a modest guardian to a symbol of the dark tribes within us. But this petrifies those who see her, disabling them to express themselves. We can only overcome ourselves if we see her through a mirror. That means if we are compassionate and see through within ourselves. The bundle of snakes 
that give shape to Medusa's hair represent the many possibilities of wisdom, healing power, birth and rebirth. So in my artwork, Medusa meets Perseus instead of a critic and punishing Perseus, his character plays a compassionate being and in lieu of a fearsome Medusa, who's playful, who represents aggressively and uh, to abuse in my worship place, a moderate and playful being. In this way, both contain each other and come to agreement. The power that was given to Medusa was such in ancient times that in Greek Roman era, it was very common to use her to decorate and to protect uh, architectural sites from the evil eye and even for amulet of protection. And it surprised me a lot when I saw that she was uh, chiseled into the stone of a synagogue from the fourth century in Chorazin in Israel at the north of Galil. Now, if you thought that in this year and a half of pandemic on total lockdown, humanity had reconsidered on the usage and care of natural resources, you were wrong. In my opinion, Medusas with their protective instinct were alerting us from what was going to happen. It was a consequence of bad management of byproducts from hospitals for the protection of the COVID-19. Now the millions of disposable masks that float in the sea surpass the millions of Medusas that seem to overpopulate the sea. And it is amongst us the decision to make changes and not to throw more garbage to the sea. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Does anybody have um, comments? Francis, she's a psychologist. I'd like to hear uh, some of your input, please. Unmute, unmute so we hear you. Well, uh, first of all, I congratulate you. I think you have amazing things to contribute. Um, and, uh, you know, there are so many subjects that you touch that uh, this is like, a, a, I'm sure, a very concise uh, part of your work. But uh, there's a lot to think about. And um, the mediums and how you do it, it's very impressive. So. I don't know about the psychological part. I mean, that's a huge thing because you obviously take different levels in all your representations and um, it, it, that could be a, a whole other <laughs> conference to just go into like what's behind it. But um, just in terms of the, the part of the tradition and uh, the environment and human relations, I think you touch on amazing so many things that we could probably talk hours about all of these so um, this was a good introduction and uh, i'm happy i know about you <laughs> we never never heard and um i know thank you for inviting me this was very interesting thank you francis S sarah do you want to share something please well uh Hello, Francis. Hola, Sara. <laughs> ¿Qué tal? Un gusto. Well, yes. And thank you very much, Annabelle, for allowing me to, to be part of, of this. And especially, Rosemary, hearing you, it was like a, a mostly I felt um, very uh, touched by your, by your words and the melody of the meaning of your words. I think that complemented uh, your art in a very special way that it uh, uh, made me like uh, go inside uh, these um, objects or, or, of the and canvas and, and uh, your thoughts uh, in this uh, presentation. It was like a, a very special experience. Your art right. is not only visual, but, but also 
an experience and an ex an vivential experience that's and i thank you very much that's great to hear thank you very much for saying that that means that i uh, i got it there yes you did yeah <laughs> thank you david would you say something please and are you related to rosemary oh oh yes we we are we are cousins okay yes. Ah. They're second cousins. So okay. Ros Rosemary is the great granddaughter of Haim Leib, who was the brother of both my great, great grand uh, parents. So, so we are doubly related. Wow. And, and I am, I'm always amazed by, by, by these pieces of art uh, because Every time, every time I attend to a to a lecture or or visit uh, an exhibition, I see something different. And uh, today, today I saw that Rosemary is uh, building archaeology, and she's putting one layer on top of the other, mm -hmm. on top of the other. Mm -hmm. And this is this is what what this is reverse archaeology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so this is what uh, what the, the opposite of a, uh, of what an archaeologist does. She's building it mm -hmm. and she's putting it there for us to explore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am amazed. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Mm. Yeah, glad that you brought that up. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Rosemary, thank you. That was very enlightening, and I uh, enjoyed very much uh, that you expanded in so many aspects uh, from abuse, uh, awareness of our environment, um, the theme of the women, uh, empowering women, uh, because throughout ages, she's been always uh, treated as an object. Uh, so I, I really have enjoyed all these different presentations, especially I like the um, interpretation, your photograph, the alterations, um, when you do even hair or whatever you're doing to alter them, because then it doesn't, you don't know what the original photograph was all about. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's been wonderful uh, and colorful and uh, in black and white, in just uh, an array of, um, presentations and it's been very interesting and your knowledge of religion also i never knew that in a synagogue they had medusas mm -hmm. i never imagined that mm -hmm. so it's been very interesting and mm -hmm. i like that uh, description that this is like an archaeological um, presentation or or search of your work i think it's wonderful because definitely there's layers of um, study uh, when you embark on a certain mm -hmm. theme mm -hmm. and you move on with it. So thank you. I really enjoyed it. We had quite a few people who logged in. Uh, this was over an hour. So some people have logged out by now, uh, but we really do appreciate your participation. This was very interesting. Do you want to add some closing remarks? Well, it was interesting to have this talk with a, with a smaller group of people because we were able to interact more. So that I appreciate and I, I understand the, these uh, platforms are looking always forward to get more people together. But this experience of having a small group was interesting because of that uh, more fast interaction between us, so, which was good. Yeah, thank you very much for your time and for showing up here and looking forward for more times with you to get more uh, input and to offer more. Thank you all for tuning in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rosemary. Really appreciate thank you very much. Team. On behalf of Naamat and to all of you who uh, contribute uh, to uh, with any donation to Naamat, uh, as I started saying that we do uh, empower women in Israel and we help women to keep their kids in 
childcare facilities, we do give counseling to women. So I think that many of the points that you touched about the women are very relevant to what Naamat is all about. And um, we're looking forward to the following presentations. For now, the only confirmed presentation I have that you can reserve the date is uh, November the 1st. Uh, Monica Burtz is doing a presentation. She's confirmed I have other people that have not confirmed yet. So for now, it's November the 1st. Please mark your calendars. And as soon as I have confirmations from my other artists, I will let you know. But thank you all. It was delightful to see you, chat with you, and I wish you the very best. Thank, thank you. you. The same. Thank you, thank the you same. very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.